morning to one and all. This is Dr. Shivani Singh, and I cordially welcome each and every one to this webinar, Perioscopy, Exploring Minimally Invasive Treatment in Diabetes. The success of the presentation will be judged not by the knowledge we send, but what the listener receives. Education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. It illuminates us with the light of knowledge and wisdom. With this in mind, Let's start with our session. We invoke the blessings of the Almighty by the virtual lighting of the lamp and invocation song. Over to you, Dr. Sumuk. Dr. Sumuk. Now I would like to invite Dr. Anita to welcome our chief guest and our keynote speaker. Over to you, Dr. Anita, for the welcome speech and the introduction of SIG. Thank you, Dr. Shivani. Well, uh, Swami Vivekananda rightly said, education is the manifestation of the perfection that is already there in a man. Namaste, welcome, good morning to all. With the blessings of the Almighty, and invoking our uh, Master Swati and the blessings of our Swamiji, Sri Sri Radhendra Swami Guru and Sri Sri Deshikendra Mahas Swami Guru. I welcome our patrons of today of our webinar from our SID Diabetes and Oral Care, Dr. Suresh Bhojraj, our Pro Chancellor of our University, Dr. Surinder Singh, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Panjanath B. Registrar at JSS AHGR, and also Dr. Kushalapa, Director of Education. To the community, a service is a matter. I welcome you, sir, our, our chief guest, Dr. Nagesh, who's been widely and a dweller in our community dental department. I welcome our uh, guest of honor and our principal, Dr. Ravindra, sir. Welcome you, sir. Okay. I welcome our speaker of the day, Dr. John Kwan, who will enrich all our knowledge that is required for our perioscopy. I welcome our teaching staff, our registered delegates, students, UG, PG, faculty, and all, for whom this particular webinar matters to improve their knowledge on our periodontal aspects. I welcome our SID team, our technical team, Dr. Samuk Bharadwaj, who's our whole and soul there, Dr. Shivani Singh, our MC. Welcome to the continuum of the webinar and of our with SID. Now to talk of our SID, we are a team working in common courses. We started it uh, around uh, uh, 2020. We were a team, uh, a group of dentists, uh, Endo and myself, uh, along with the advisory committee of Dr. Ravindra Sir, our principal, Dr. Sheila Kumar Gujri, our uh, physician group of uh, uh, Dr. Prasanna Kumar, microbiologist chief, Dr. Tejshri Aris, and uh, Dr. Vidya Chitagupti, biochemistry doctor, uh, Shweta, and our Jane from our pharmacy group, community dentist, our uh, Sunil, uh, uh, so, uh, community medicine, we have Dr. Sunil, and our uh, new entry that we have, Dr. Maurya, who's our community dentist. Now, we are working as a common force. We, we aim to diagnose interrepper, which is interdisciplinary, which is quite vital in diabetes research or treatment. We conduct educative programs and incorporate the best educative practices. We, be, uh, we aim to bring out better trained students in that particular aspect. We also apply funds and uh, we aim to increase the dental OPD statistics with interdisciplinary uh, reference. We uh, formed the, uh, hit, uh, this SID group as periodontitis is now considered the sixth complication of uh, diabetes. And uh, it is associated with uh, certain periodontal changes. We also have other oral changes. So it is quite vital that 
we thrive in that area so that students learn to diagnose, to treat, and we invade into the uh, pre-diabetic stage to reduce the uh, diabetic uh, profile, to reduce the uh, uh, economic burden on the patient and the society. So we've opened two diabetic clinics, one at the Department of Periodontal GGS's Dental College and Hospital, the other one at the Department of Dental Science, uh, GS's Multispeciality Hospital, uh, 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 and that's at Agrahara Mysore. So we have two wings that is uh, going on. So uh, with this uh, brief introduction, I would like also to tell uh, that uh, uh, education is the most powerful weapon, which is very able to rule the globe. Thank you. I welcome you all. Have a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anita. I would now like to request Dr. Maurya to take over and introduce the guest of honor, Dr. Ravindra sir. Over to you, Maurya sir. Uh, good morning, all. I would like to, I take this honor to uh, introduce our beloved principal, Dr. Ravindra sir. Uh, sir has completed his uh, Bachelor of Dental Surgery in the year 1986, Master of Dental Surgery in 1989. Sir was uh, the third batch student of Bapuji Dental College and Hospital Dhawangere, and he continued as a staff in Bapuji Dental College and Hospital, then JSS Dental College and Hospital, SDM College of Dental Sciences, Darwad, Asanamba Dental College, Asan. Sir has 13 years of administrative experience and also 31 years of teaching experience. Sir has also almost around more than 60 publications in both national and international level. This is a, a brief introduction of our beloved principal, Dr. Ravindra sir. Over to you, Dr. Shiva. Now I request our beloved principal, sir, to kindly share his opinion. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you, Dr. Moria, for your introduction. Good morning, everyone. Seeking the blessings of His Holiness, Sri Shivara, Sri Deshiki and Ramana Swamiji, respected Chief Guest, Professor K.S. Nagesh, the resource person, Professor Dr. John N. Kwan, Diplomate of American Board of Periodontology and Clinical Professor, California, USA, SIG Group Leader, Dr. Anita, invitees, faculties, and dear students. The use of perioscope in the treatment of periodontal disease has advanced periodontics significantly. In fact, uh, it has helped uh, many periodontists to manage many cases non-surgically. I am sure learning about perioscope will encourage and motivate us towards using it in the near future. Today, we have Dr. John N. Kwan, who has been practicing perioendoscopy for a long time now. I'm sure this webinar will assist us in learning more about it. I appreciate and thank him for accepting our invitation to share his knowledge. I convey my heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Professor K.S. Nagesh for his support and timely advices in all our endeavors. I express my appreciation to the special interest group on diabetes and oral health for hosting this webinar. Thank you so thank you all so much. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you. One and all. Thank you so much, sir. I would now like to hand over the platform to Dr. Anita to introduce our chief guest. Uh, I welcome you, sir, Dr. Nagesh. He's a strategic healthcare consultant and advisor for all over 40 plus years of experience in leading and facilitating the design and completion of highly visible, sensitive, and multifaceted projects. Uh, executives and implements on high priority strategic in initiatives oversees all aspects of assigned healthcare projects at both state and private sectors. Uh, he's the executive chairman, ethics committee for human subjects, behavioral science division, Nimans Bangalore, acts as an advisor or thought partner by structuring undefined issues for resolution research issues, summarizing information and working with relevant stakeholders to provide 
the information needed to make sound and timely decisions. Executive Chairman of Asia Dental Forum India, acting as the institutional lead for interpreting the implications of both proposed and final laws and regulations, developing consensus on policy positions and leading advocacy and government relations strategies to advance those positions. He's the AIDS Director and Consultant, Department of Public Health, Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bangalore. He was the former principal of RV Dental College and Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Namaste, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's my pleasure to invite our chief guest, Dr. Nagesh, to enlighten us with a few words. Uh, good morning, everybody. Namaskar. It's a pleasure for me to be uh, part of this uh, symposium, which is of very uh, greater clinical significance for all the dental surgeons, especially the periodontists. First of all, I would like to thank the JSS University, principal of JSS Dental College for inviting me to have the uh, inaugural address. We need to have uh, a constant interaction with all the... Very happy to know that uh, from Dr. John Yang Huang from University, University of Southern California joining uh, and uh, giving uh, his expertise in the field of this perioscope, exchange ideas with other faculties. So first of all, I congratulate this university and the college for uh, including the other faculty. So, see, benefits of perioscope has been outlined by the various studies. It is the perioscope. See, today is a world hard today. All over the world, they are celebrating uh, with uh, seminars or workshops. And uh, there's a long history that uh, very bad uh, periodontal condition or gingival conditions can also precipitate or argument uh, heart attacks because anywhere in the body, if there is a infection, then natural in mind, in patients treated with uh, diabetes, uncontrolled diabetes leads to multiple organ infection, including oral cavity, early mortality of the tooth. But we are also facing the newer technology in medical science, like laparoscopy and robotic surgery has revolutionized the treatment, reducing the hospital and the risk of it area, which is now very much focused on its application in medicine, dentistry, and other branches. So we have to explore how exactly this early intelligence helps in early diagnosis and the early diagnosis of various medical conditions. I want to suggest to the uh, dental college and the university to focus on three areas. One study was conducted in uh, Brazil when I was working uh, in government dental college way back in the 90s, the saucer-shaped uh, uh, pitting on the occlusal surface of first permanent molar can predict the diabetes. This study was carried out in Brazil. Later on, I think uh, nobody has focused on this. One explanation for this change in the first molar, permanent first molar, is the eyelids of Langerhans cells and the enamel of first molar develop at the same time, as a result of which uh, there will be early uh, diagnosis of uh, uh, diabetes because these first molar and eyelids of Langerhans they develop at the same time of intrauterine uh, period. Any genetic alterations could lead to such change. I request uh, our colleagues to ponder over this. Further, I had a chance to work with Professor Gundurao of Minnesota University, who tried to develop a glucometer by taking the salivary sample. Instead of uh, in diabetic patients, we have to repeatedly check the blood sugar, especially when they're hospital, hospitalized. So 
if uh, studies on saliva is taken up seriously, we can develop a non-invasive uh, glucometer. And uh, uh, I will uh, try to put Dr. Gundura, who has now migrated to US to contact with uh, JSS uh, University and then college to take up the study as it will be a boon to the patients. I'm sure that participants will be benefited by this program and ultimately uh, patients. So I'm uh, New Year Technologies, it is opening up as a result of which the procedures, surgical procedures, length is reduced and the patient will be more comfortable and early recovery. I'm sure this periscope becomes part and parcel of the routine treatment at the college level, as well as the practitioners. And more practitioners, if they are trained with a short-term course by the JSS and the college, it will be a boon for them, ultimately benefiting the patient. I once again thank the JSS University and dental faculty for inviting me, Dr. Ravindra, the principal of JSS and college, as a chief guest to deliver the inaugural address. I really enjoy whatever the proceedings of this uh, program in the hours to come. And uh, I profusely thank all of you for patient hearing. And uh, I'm sure that with a multidisciplinary approach, we will be able to bring out more uh, benefits to the patients and involve this in the treatment of the various specialities of dentistry and not only in periodontics, so that it will ultimately benefit the general population. And uh, early uh, diagnosis and treatment with this perioscope will be a boon to diabetic patients as the mortality will be, tooth mortality will be more in diabetics if it is unnoticed and untreated. Thank you all very much for the patient hearing. So I look forward for a very fruitful discussion and also lecture from our guests from USA. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Bye. Thank you, sir. You uh, rightly said, sir, uh, we need to invade and we need to look at salivary di uh, diagnostic. And thank you for the referral of Dr. Gundu Rao, uh, who's there in US. We would like to partner with him for our uh, research projects. Thank you, sir, and namaste. Thank you for the kind time. Sir, so, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, again for the enlightening words. Uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Maurya to present the vote of thanks. Maurya, sir, to you. The blessings of the Almighty and His Holiness Swamiji and on behalf of our organizing committee and uh, special interest group team, I thank all the dignitaries of today's event. Expressing my heartfelt gratitude to our patrons of JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, Dr. Suresh Mee, Pro-Chancellor, Dr. Surinder Singh, Vice-Chancellor, Dr. Manjunatha B. Registrar, Dr. Kushalapa PA, Director Academics. I also uh, wish to thank our chief guest, Dr. K.S. Nagesh, and guest of honor, Dr. Ravindra Sir. I would like to thank our keynote speaker, Dr. John Yang Kwan, and uh, special thanks to all the participants, all the general practitioners, uh, the undergraduate and postgraduate students. Thanks to our IT team, JSS AHER, especially Dr. Sumuk for coordinating this event. A special thanks to Dr. Shivani Singh for all the scheduled program of today's uh, webinar. Thank you, one and all. Dr. Shivani. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Maria, sir. Uh, now I request everyone to rise in honor of the national anthem. I request everyone to please stand up. Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha, Dravida, Pukkala, Vanga, Vindahima, Chalaya, Munaganga, Pukkala,
चल जलध तरंगा तव शुभ नाम जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे Thank you, everyone. Uh, we now commence with our session. I request Dr. Anita to introduce our speakers. Who knows us better? Fail, 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 and then persistent, as rightly said by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we fell down to who know better than we are doing in scaling. Uh, uh, we've always found it difficult, isn't it? As UGs or as PGs or at some point of time. Dental clock is the microbiological type one error, as all of us agree. And the calculus, with its elements, uh, were waiting for it to be calcified or already calcified. And the tooth that undergoes, and the periodontion that undergoes the changes. This warrants the removal either by hand instruments, ultrasonics, or whatever that Dr. John Wong is going to introduce to all of us today. Now we also have a longer time, a blinder procedure worker works on tac, uh, you know. Uh, more working on tactile perception and a look at the rough surface. Diabetes is anyway a metabolic disease with a lot of healing issues, be it periodontal or extra oral. So we also require a minimalistic approach. Periscopy would lead a path of minimal damage to the tissues along with the identification of the, of the vital uh, removal of the calculus to heal, to treat and to belong as periodontists. Mm -hmm. To introduce Dr. Kwon, he graduated from the USC in 1976 with a Bachelor of Science and later received his doctorate of dental surgery from USC in 1981. John served in the US Air Force for 10 years as a general dentist and as a periodontist. He has published many peer-reviewed journals, such as Journal of Perio, uh, the Journal of American Dental Association, and the Journal of the California Dental Association, among the other national and international journals and textbooks. His periodontal practice includes clinical research education and serving as an advisor to dental product and technology com companies. He's a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology and is an associate clinical professor at UCSF School of Dentistry. He maintains a private practice in Oakland, Berkeley area. California. Uh, his uh, treatment focus is on minimally invasive care for periodontal and implant patients. The, he emphasizes on periodontal endoscopy and microsurgery. He is currently a clinical consultant for Zest Dental Education Solutions, the providers of periodontal endoscopy equipment, education, and technology. I welcome you, Dr. John Kwon, and we now start our webinar series. Sorry, webinar talk. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, I'll get my screen together. Well, thank you all for the wonderful introduction. And um, I hope you can see my screen okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, awesome. Got some videos here. And we'll explain these videos. Um, <clears throat> I've been a periodontist for, um, in the Berkeley area of California for 30 years. And I just retired um, earlier this year. So um, actually today I went into the office and saw three follow-up patients and um, a grafting patient, a gum graft patient, uh, and, and a couple implant patients. And so it was kind of, it was nice to be back in the office because I, you know, haven't been doing that. I've been uh, <clears throat> up in Idaho, just being outdoors, fly fishing, things like that. However, that really doesn't change 
the um, the message that I want to share with you today. And this is on perioscopy. So the American Dental Association Council on Scientific Affairs, um, they have a statement that current evidence suggests that therapies intended to arrest and control periodontitis depend primarily on effective root debridement. And so that's where we are. And uh, effective root debridement is not very easy to do if you can't see what you're doing. No matter how good you think your tactile senses are, they're just not good enough. And here's kind of proof. Um, this is a, some statistics from the United States. Pretty much half of our adult population has some level of periodontal disease. And 8% um, of that is severe periodontal disease. So we really uh, have a problem that's not being solved. Um, here are some of the limitations. When we open things up, even on single rooted teeth, you can see where things are missed. So if we go through some literature, there's a lot of literature um, indicating that scaling root planning can reduce gingivitis or reduce inflammation or reduce the infection, uh, reducing inflammation, probing depths, and can result in attachment gain. So we know that. <clears throat> we also know from other studies that with probing depths over five millimeters, there's a high probability of continued disease, inflammation, and attachment loss. Well, why? Because we're not cleaning the calculus off, which is a result of the infection that is periodontal disease. Then we look at other studies. Scaling root plane is not adequate for removal of plaque and calculus greater than three millimeters from difficult anatomical areas to clean because you can't see what you're doing. So enter perioscopy or periodontal endoscopy. This is a 20 to 40 X endoscopic magnification of the sun gingival environment. And we use this to treat periodontal disease. <clears throat> you can use it as a diagnostic tool, but while you're doing this diagnosis, you're also doing the treatment. And is this non-surgical? Yes. In the medical world, when you look at endoscopy, it's a surgical procedure. In dentistry, this is actually a non-surgical procedure because you don't have to do any cutting. You just place this camera subgingivally. And so in the US, most of this is done by hygienists and hygienists work without an assistant. And this is a game changer. <clears throat> this is something that hugely changed my practice. And um, even though I'm now retired 20 years later, it's still not well adopted in this country and certainly not in our world. Well, what are some candidates for periodontal endoscopy? Well, initial therapy. You have a diagnosis of periodontal disease. You know there's calculus associated with that subgingivally. You can do that post-initial therapy. Say you do it blindly, then you go back and either open it up or put a little camera in there. Patients who decline surgery, there are plenty of those. Patients where surgery is contraindicated for medical reasons, and this is why um, your focus is on diabetes, uh, poor, poor oral hygiene. And you know there are plenty of people that have that. And in the aesthetic zone, you really don't want to be um, creating longer teeth. Uh, maintenance patients, chronically inflamed pockets, increasing pockets, and suspected subgingival pathology, such as caries, root fractures, resorption, or perforations. Like, you know, once a month we would get uh, fracture rule outs. 
And a lot of times, the only tooth in the mouth with a root canal that you would certainly suspect it was fractured would just have calculus there. Okay, so what are some contraindications for debridement, open debridement? Well, if you're diabetic, are you gonna heal predictably from surgery? And if you're a diabetic smoker, and there are plenty of those as well, people that with poor oral hygiene, poor compliance, for supportive periodontal treatment, patients who are on blood thinners, the aesthetic zone again. Plenty of patients are now on bone sparing drugs and we don't necessarily wanna do surgery exposing bone and patients who have a history of radiation. So there's plenty of reasons why open debridement is not the best idea. Okay, so in 1981, this uh, subgingival use of an endoscope was patented uh, by a Bennett Jacoby, who was a dentist in the Los Angeles area, who's now a, um, a periodontist in Hawaii. <clears throat> uh, with his permission, they formed a company, some engineers formed a company called Dental View and made a unit called the DV2 in 2001. And they sold over 300 of these. They were good, but they weren't really good. And the company was going out of business and I was using this technology. So I ended up creating a company called Perioscopy Incorporated in 2007. And I developed a better perioscope. We supported the dental view technology and um, Danville Materials is a, is a worldwide company. They were our distributor. The patent expired. I was able to then do new development and fabricate a prototype of the new periodontal endoscope, which is we're still using the same endoscope now. Um, and then in 2014, a new system was available and we started selling that worldwide. However, worldwide in only company countries that had the proper registration. So currently we have users in the US and all over the rest of the world. Um, although it's still not as much as I would have hoped for. Um, so what do we call this? We call this subgingival ultrasonic endoscopic periodontal debridement or perioscopy. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I've treated over 10,000 cases, or it says 1,000 cases, uh, 1,000 cases or over 10,000 teeth at least. Um, normally I would do full mouth treatments at averaging from an hour and a half to maybe two and a half hours <clears throat> and treating moderate to advanced patients. And I would use a combination um, and or IV sedation treatments. Our hygiene department, and we have dental hygienists who can do this. Um, they normally do this in an hour and a half to two and a half hours and do half mouths at a time. We give them plenty of time and, um, but they know when they're finished because they can see when it's clean. They're treating moderate to advanced, localized advanced patients, and local anesthetic is necessary for this. Um, we premedicate with an NZ, typically, which in our case is typically an aproxen sodium. And it's just the over the counter dose of 440 milligrams. <clears throat> How do you get training for this? Well, uh, in this country, we sell the system with the training. So you get the training in your office. It takes about a day to train. Most hygienists are doing the training and they're skilled anyway. And, um, you know, we just teach them how to use a camera. Um, however, what I found is that uh, typically musicians, athletes and video gamers pick this up the quickest. And some hygiene programs in this country expose uh, their students to the perioscope of varying levels. Some like USC actually has to do hands-on, others just kind of introduce them to the technology and let them know um, about it. There are internet sources for 
education, like we have a lot of videos um, that I'll share um, on how to find them, uh, but mostly on YouTube. Um, then there's certainly observation or patient demonstration. Um, however, say for example, in California, you could come here and we could you could watch, but you can't treat patients unless you're licensed in this state. So there are barriers to implementation. Um, change is not an easy thing for anybody, for doctors, the hygiene staff, the administration, everybody has to be on board. And there are limited training opportunities because you're not gonna learn this in school. And uh, there may be limits to the uh, equipment because there are only two companies in the world that are making this kind of endoscope that you can actually do something with. However, you can actually treat periodontal disease endoscopically. Uh, say the doctor has a vision, but the hygiene does not, or vice versa. You know, it really has to be a team thing. Um, and the cost, uh, the perception of the learning curve. Some people say, well, you know, I can't do that. No, I, I just don't uh, think I could play that game. And it, essentially, it's a video game that you, in this country you get paid to play. Okay, let's go over the system components. There's a monitor so that you can see what the camera is looking at. There's a controller box. And uh, this, this device right here is, there's a camera in here and it's a simple CCD chip. And inside here is an LED light, 120 lumen, 60,000 hour LED. So these basically, these components are like bulletproof. Um, so there's a controller box that aids in taking the image from the camera and putting it on the monitor. There's a water bottle, and this is an air pressurized water bottle. It's a very simple device. It's in all dental operatories in the US and probably a lot of dental operatories around the world. And this creates um, water pressure so that you have irrigation subgingivally over the camera. So there's a system with a cart, a controller box, water, a, uh, a monitor, a camera and a light source, and then a fiber optic probe. This fiber optic probe is um, housed in a, a protective sheath. And um, it has a small spring in here so that um, when you put this fiber into this sheath, the spring helps to push the fiber to the end of the sheath. The fiber is one millimeter in diameter and one meter long. Inside, there is an image guide that's a 10,000 pixel image guide that picks up the image. And then there are 19, 120 micron diameter light guides. And this is the, all these are packed into a one millimeter diameter endoscopic fiber. That fiber is isolated by the perioscopy sheet. This is a sterile single use device kind of like a surgical blade. So you snake the fiber into the, um, the sheath and the fiber gets pushed by that spring to the very end of a metal cannula that has a sealed sapphire lens at the end. Then there's a parallel sheath that is blue in this case, and it conveys water from that pressurized water bottle over the end of the camera. That sheath fiber complex is placed into an explorer and these explorers are bent so that you can see on one side or the other of the tooth or the back sides of teeth. So these four explorers allow you to see all the way around each tooth. 
So here you see in my hand, the Explorer with the sheath fiber complex. So if you look at Julia, who's a hygienist, when she cleans teeth manually, uh, she's using these instruments. And then when she's got a periodontal case, she's got all these instruments and ultrasonics. Well, these are all to make up for the fact that Julia can't see. When you see, when you can see, you really don't need many instruments. You need an ultrasonic. That's just a standard magnetostrictive ultrasonic. It can be piezo as well, but it's a, it's a probe-like instrument that instruments pretty much 99% of all the areas that you can see with the aid of this, these instruments. And then every once in a while, you need some uh, curved ones. So we have our basic setup, an explorer, a mirror, a perio probe, a saliva ejector with what's called a soft stop on it, which I call a suction muffler. And this is our whole setup, that and local anesthetic. So endoscopic instrumentation, it's a two-handed technique. When you play a video game, it's two hands. When you play this game, it's two hands and two feet. You have an endoscope in your left hand if you're right-handed. You have an instrument in your right hand and you move together around the tooth while you're cleaning, looking at a screen because this is an endoscopic procedure. It's not a blind procedure and it's not a open surgical procedure where you have to look in the mouth visually. Um, we use powered instruments only. We don't use any hand instruments. And when you look and see at 20 to 40 mag, how, it, how an ultrasonic instrument cleans, it's proof that that's all you need. Two-handed technique, view an instrument at the same time. Uh, you know, you have to be proficient with your non-dominant hand. You know, um, I'm sure a lot of you eat with your non-dominant hand. Um, you can practice using chopsticks with both hands. Um, or you can practice dentistry or hygiene. How many, I mean, how many of us, all of us, use both hands all the time? So here you've got a little example of the camera going around and then turning it sideways to look in approximately on the mesial surface of a molar. Well, what about the distal surface? You have these bent uh, explorers that allow you to look forward in the mouth and then if you really need that angle, you can use a curved ultrasonic instrument. Here is uh, what we call cross instrumenting with the straight or the curved instrument where you have the camera coming in from the buccal aspect and the ultrasonic instrument coming in from the lingual aspect. Here's a technique in action. Two hands, two feet, positioning the instruments in the mouth and looking at the screen and cleaning. This is a hygienist, Chris, who I saw today at the office. And, um, you know, basically she's microscopically doing subgingival root debridement looking at a screen. And we'll go over image interpretation uh, soon. Okay, so <clears throat> here we have the system. You can see the system was on her left, kind of like her assistant. The uh, explorers have a shield. And so the, sh the sheath fiber complex, which has a, the fiber sealed inside this metal cannula, stop short of the shield, the shield pushes the soft tissue out of the way, and you're looking at about maybe three millimeters at a time. So here you see the shield, the soft tissue, and the root surface, Ooh, let me go back, and the root surface with calculus. Now this light is quite bright, 
So if calculus is maybe brown or black, it's going to show up as white or yellow, but it's going to show up enough so that you know that this is not normal root structure. Okay, so let's go back. <clears throat> so what you're seeing here is a video. There's the shield. It's pushing the soft tissue out of the way. Here's a lower molar furcation with an enamel projection. Let's take a look at that. So here I'm using a diamond instrument to plasty out that enamel projection. And if you're using diamond instruments subgingibly and not seeing what you're doing, you have no idea what kind of damage you're doing to the root. Or if you have a sharp curette, you have no idea either. It might be clean, it might be over clean, or a lot of times it's under cleaned. So here is our advanced set. We have the bent right and left and straight, but they're diamond coated. So we can plasty things like overhanging margins, enamel projections, enamel pearls, uh, globular cementum, things like that that uh, aren't easy to remove with just the standard ultrasonics. Okay, here's, here's an example of some caries on a tube. So somebody decided, oh, well, we'll do this amalgam, but I don't want to do my margin and it, you know, on the on two structure, I'll just do it on the amalgam because I got all the carries anyway. Oh, but no, wait, they didn't get the carries. So probably the biggest thing we diagnose other than, you know, calculus and clean that off is subgingival carries in approximately. Here's a situation where uh, they uh, suspected a fracture, took some disclosing solution, stained it, went in with the endoscope. You can see a lot of inflammation, a lot of inflamed tissue, and here's that fracture. Okay, so this patient has an implant now. Oops, it's kind of going slow on me. Okay, all right, so check this out. This is my wife's uh, knee surgery, you know. The resolution is phenomenal on this endoscope, but it's considerably larger. It might be anywhere from four to five times larger. Um, so the resolution is quite good. So with this small, camera, tiny, tiny camera though, I'm looking at uh, Abraham Lincoln's eyeball on the US $5 bill. So we're really seeing quite, quite well. <clears throat> this was at a dental meeting where I was looking at my driver's license and recording this with my iPhone. Same thing here, I was recording this with my iPhone, but I was showing a video. No, we were actually doing a debridement. You can see some calculus here, the sheet, the root surface, the ultrasonic tip, you know, and people go, oh, is there enough room for all of that? Yes, there is. Let's check this one out. There's just hunks, large areas of subgingival calculus right there. And what's interesting is if you push a little harder with the ultrasonic, you actually get more power. You do not dampen the vibrations when you push a little harder. Although if you're not looking, you push a little harder, you can make a nice little groove in the root. Okay, let's take a look at this video. Here we've got a shield, the root surface, soft tissue, the ultrasonic, and calculus, those little white specks, that's calculus. We're cleaning that off at magnifications of 20 to 40X, just depending upon where you are 
um, in the focal length, which is about maybe uh, three to four millimeters. So here you see the same uh, aspect, the, sh the shield, soft tissue, and then calculus. This calculus is showing up a little more brown. And we're doing uh, visual endoscopic debridements all the time. We just don't, you know, in our practice, we just would not waste our time doing it blindly. So here you see the current system, a card, um, the water bottle with a, a simple pedal that's just like uh, the one you use with your, uh, your air-driven handpiece, um, a controller going to a camera light source, going to a fiber in its protective shield. This is the old system. And now we have a bigger image. And these are both, these images are both looking at the inside of this protective sheet. So let's see, I can't see that. Let me, let me see if I can see my slide. Oh, there. Okay, let's look at the perioscopy system. Something's going kind of, oh. Okay, what are the best uses for this? You know, people come up to me and they say, well, you know, can we use this in endo? Can we use this in this? We can... But basically, endoscopic uh, subgingival viewing for ultrasonic debridement to treat periodontal disease, which is not going away, and, and you, it's, it's epidemic. It doesn't require an assistant. You can adjust things like the focus, the brightness, the contrast. Um, it has different outputs. It has S-video output. It has USB 2.0. It has an analog composite video output. You, uh, there is video imaging software available, or you could just get a simple digital uh, recorder toy. And one of, one of the best ones I have is uh, a toy from Japan. Um, it has a CCD camera, very simple CCD camera, an LED light source that lasts forever, a controller, a fiber optic probe, comes with a cart, a water delivery device, and accessories like sheets and a floor. So there aren't a lot of you know, the explorers, you may end up buying every maybe six to nine months. And the sheets, obviously, you have to use uh, single, -way, single use. Well, some people do single patient. So they do one half the mouth, the other half the mouth with the same uh, sheath. And it saves on some of the cost. Um, and it also includes in-office training, at least here. So let's talk a little bit about how does... How is this working? In our uh, office, we kind of prescribe to cleaning and disinfecting. Okay, so the cleaning is done endoscopically. The disinfecting is done various ways with either systemic antibiotics, local antibiotics, or disinfecting irrigation. We do full mouth microultrasonic endoscopic debridement, or some, sometimes we do half mouths with optional adjunctive antibiotics, because this is a bacterial infection. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows that when you use adjunctive antibiotics, you always do better than without it. Um, typically we're using azithromycin, 500 milligrams a day for three days. We use Arrestin, which is a local delivery minocycline at times. Uh, when patients come in, I call them subacute. There's lots of edema, erythema, bleeding on probing, obvious infection. Um, a lot of times we'll put those patients immediately on metronidazole and amoxicillin, both 500 milligrams times 14 or for a week, twice a day. And then we start them on uh, some sort of water irrigation, like a water pick. And then we do the definitive scope later. Uh, we know by other studies from Chile that this does stop the progression of the disease. And um, so it buys us some time. 
uh, it allows us to do debridement in a, in a more friendly environment with lot less um, infection. What are our treatment goals? Well, these are classic periodontal therapy treatment goals. goals. We wanna interrupt the disease process. We want to maintain or regenerate periodontal or peri-implant support, which we're not talking about today. Um, but you have to expect your treatment to resolve the inflammatory disease. So for example, let's go over this case. This, this patient was come, uh, referred to have an upper denture and some implants and then uh, lower periodontal surgery. Well, we did this antibiotic, we did the endoscopic debridement and after a year and we put the patient, she had a lot of mobility. So we did put the patient in a uh, retainer, a trutane retainer. Uh, which is a uh, O2O vinyl suck down type retainer. And um, a year later, she still had her teeth and with very manageable probing depths and same thing on the lower. Things got better because not only we did we do the disinfecting, but we did cleaning that um, we knew was clean. Here's another case, general, uh, moderate to advanced periodontal disease, took out some teeth. And um, here you can see what it looked like at six weeks and then at 18 weeks. So we're not rushing into doing surgery. Um, here's a patient who came back at six weeks and this didn't get better. So we rescoped it, we put a rest in there and it did get better. And um, <clears throat> she had a restoration here. But you can see we cleaned, we disinfected, and it was biologically acceptable and the body healed itself. Less probing and more bone. Here's a patient that uh, just is just one quarter of his mouth, um, deep pocketing, got better and continued to get better. And radiographically, you can see lots of calculus here on the x-ray and then the bone healed. So we're happy. It's another patient, you can see, we'll, we'll kind of look at this area. Um, and then I think this area here, but ultrasonic debridement, endoscopically, adjunctive antibiotics, uh, supportive periodontal treatment, and Patients get better. You can see how the bone filled in there. And then all these vertical lesions heal. You could do this a lot of different ways. You know, you could use a laser, maybe it, that'll work. I mean, anecdotally, I mean, this is what we're doing here, showing you this. Um, you could do surgery. You could do surgery with all kinds of other adjuncts. But, um, you know, this pocket healed and the bone filled in, this pocket healed and the bone filled in. So uh, one of my students and I, we did a retrospective case series of 270 consecutively treated patients with at least a year follow-up. And these patients had a, like an average of, I think three years follow-up. Um, so we looked at molars, we looked at premolars, and we looked at anterior teeth. We looked at probings of 10 to 11 millimeters, 7 to 9 millimeters, and uh, 4 to 6 millimeters. And we look, well, we're looking at the percent of pocketing that was reduced after at least a year. So here's molars, 10 to 11 millimeters, 71% reduced to 6 to 9 millimeters, but 20% reduced to five millimeters or less. That was a small sample, relatively small sample, but we saved those teeth. Seven to nine millimeters, over half of them reduced to five millimeters or less. And that was 284 teeth. Five to six millimeter probings went to four millimeters or less, about 70% of those. And that was in molars. Um, almost 480 teeth. 
If it looks like a premolars, 10 to 11 millimeter probing is almost 40%. And you know, we've got single root teeth now reduced to five millimeters or less. There were only eight of those. Oh, almost 60% of the seven to nine millimeter pocketing reduced to five millimeters or less. And five to six millimeters, almost 80% reduced to four millimeters or less. And that was 266 teeth. The anterior teeth, 10 millimeter, 10 to 11 millimeter probings, over 70% reduced to five millimeters or less. So much more predictable, you know, in pretty much anything we do because they're simpler roots. Seven to nine millimeter anteriors, almost 90% reduced to five millimeters or less. And five to six millimeters, over 90% reduced to four millimeters or less. So for me, this was my evidence. You know, we're all about evidence-based treatment. And this is my evidence because, you know, I was seeing this every day, but now I have numbers to back it up. Um, uh, the University of Minnesota has a hygiene group that's doing um, some research, 26 um, endoscopic versus tactile evaluation of subgingival calculus. Well, you know, this is kind of a no brainer, but uh, 26 subjects with moderate periodontitis, one quad for tactile detection, one quad for tactile and endoscopic detection. And then they had a calculus index score. And uh, so what they found was significantly more calculus was detected endoscopically versus tactile explore at all visits. Well, duh, it's, it's pretty obvious that if you can't see it, you can't feel it. Um, conclusion, visual detected via endoscope was helpful in the reevaluation phase. Well, it's totally more helpful in the treatment phase. Uh, one of my professors at USC did a study, um, a retrospective look at periodontal endoscopy after three years. Okay, this was 626 sites, uh, pockets four to six millimeters, had a reduction of almost two millimeters with the endoscope, whereas traditional scaling root playing in the literature is half of that. And Roger Stambaugh did a lot of these studies, traditional studies. So, um, an attachment gain was two millimeters, whereas scaling and root planing reported a quarter of that with scaling and root plane. Pockets over six millimeters, reduction of over four millimeters with the endoscope, whereas traditional scale and root planing is about half, an attachment gain of over four millimeters and traditional scaling root planing is about a quarter of that. I have a friend in uh, Ohio and in 20 years, he was doing capital debridement with ultrasonics and antibiotics and find that 70% 70 of the five mil 10 millimeter pockets reduced to four millimeters or less. That's just doing it blindly uh, but after two and a half years of using the endoscope, 90% of the five to 10 millimeter pockets reduced to four millimeters or less. And this was over 1700 sites he evaluated. So there was an interesting study from China, uh, the effects of periodontal endos endoscopy on the treatment of periodontitis, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And this was in 2000, sorry, 2017. Um, the authors found no sufficient evidence to support the difference between the use of periodontal endoscopy and traditional scaling root planing. And I look at that and I'm going, wait a minute. Uh, they also concluded that periodontal endoscopy may provide additional benefits for calculus removal, although it may take more time. Okay, so their systematic review and meta-analysis included only eight studies. Four of them had no follow-up and four of them had six to three months follow-up. So I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not real happy with the number of studies they had and making those conclusions. Uh, periodontal endoscopy, the advantage is the ability to remove calculus. Well, yeah, the disadvantage, it may require more time. 
Well, I have a problem with that because more time that when you're doing it blindly, you have no idea when you're finished. So you cannot compare time between the two methods with two different endpoints. So uh, even though that study exists, I'm not real happy about it. And when you compare it to open debridement, and I've done plenty of that, it certainly takes way less time. So here's a hygienist who, you know, you have an abutment to a four unit bridge and it looks like this. And you're thinking, okay, well, let's just take out this whole bridge or take out part of the bridge and put in two or three implants. Well, that patient had this also in the front and had this endoscopic debridement and some arrest in. And here, if you look at what it looks like, we save those teeth. Here's a situation that, you know, if I pulp tested this tooth and it was positive, then I might go ahead and do this. But this is an amazing result. And these, these people in New Zealand are just experts at this. Here's another, here's a, here's, this was the dentist upstairs from that office in New Zealand. And, um, you know, I would have probably taken this tooth out, but here it is four years later. You can even do this with implants, not real predictable with implants because these implant surfaces are so wonky, you know, very hard to debride screw threads. And these are big screw threads. They're not little ones like, you know, a lot of implants have. This tooth tested vital. So they went and endoscopically debrided it here and look at this result. This is that same office in New Zealand. Um, this is some friends of theirs that are doing a prospective study on uh, the effects of periodontal endoscopy. And here's, you know, deep pocket, vertical bone loss, get it clean, get it disinfected, let it heal. Here's a patient that I saw on follow-up after um, we did an implant and then the patient came back for some follow-up and you could see some cement right here. So I went and cleaned that out, made sure that the uh, cement wasn't there on the x-ray and that got better. Here's another patient that had just a blowout. Um, 12, 10 to 12 millimeter pocketing, and then, and now it probes four to five millimeters. So what about the LANAP procedure, the laser assisted new attachment procedure? Um, what about that? That uses a laser to basically disinfect, but you still have to use an ultrasonic to do the cleaning and you still cannot see what you're doing. It's a surgical procedure. It's classified as a surgical procedure. It's for doctors only. It's a full mouth protocol. They use ultrasonic instruments. There's no direct vision. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty aggressive occlusal adjustment. They charge surgical fees. You have to have training for a week and the system costs over $100,000. The perioscopy, on the other hand, is non-surgical. A hygienist or a doctor can do it. It's limited or full mouth treatment. Use the same ultrasonic instruments. It's real-time video. We do occlusal adjustment as needed, mostly in cases with frematis. Uh, treatment is anywhere from $1,200 to $4,000. And... Um, Whereas the Lanap procedure is typically anywhere, it's kind of six to $8,000 in our area. Um, and the training is online study and one day clinical. Then you just do, a, you just practice. Um, and it's less than $20,000 in this country with training. What about lasers? What about lasers in non-surgical treatment? Okay, as an adjunct, that's, that's sold a lot around here in this country is use a laser because lasers do everything. Patients love lasers. And um, so 
let's do some disinfecting with the laser, even though we can't clean as effectively as we'd like to. And, you know, let's say that this is going to be better because I'm using a laser as an adjunct. Well, mechanical, chemical, or laser curatos has little or no benefit beyond scaling and root planing alone. And we have evidence for though that conclusion. Effective root debridement is really the key. So neither lasers nor photodynamic therapy, which is you know, using a low level uh, uh, red laser um, to kill uh, bacteroides, I believe, um, provide predictable and consistent results compared to scaling or playing alone. Erbium lasers do show uh, the greatest potential for root debridement. Clinical attachment level data is conflicting and uh, Erbium YAG lasers do clean calculus, but they do clean cementum and dentin as well. So the AAP came out with this statement uh, quite a while ago. So, you know, there's still a lot of, oh, let's, you know, let's do a laser because we can make more money using a laser. There is another copycat uh, endoscope system. It's by a company called Oraview. They have some innovative things, but, you know, um, it's just, uh, it's not as good and it's a little more expensive. So let's talk about uh, advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is either the learning curve or the perception of the learning curve. You know, we do a lot of things that take uh, quite a bit of hand skill. So if you wanna do something, you know, you do it. If you wanna play a video game, you have to practice or you're not gonna be any good, period. Especially if you're doing something like uh, driving, you know, because that is two hands and two feet. Formula One or I don't know the other ones. Um, learning curve, you have to buy something, you have a consumable that you have to buy, and there aren't many teachers teaching this. Um, and it's not surgery. So us as periodontists, we're going, oh, it's not surgery, you know, why do I want to get involved in something that's not surgical? It's a hygiene tool. It's disruptive. Well, what are some of the advantages? Well, it's minimally invasive. You can use this for treatment. You can use it for a diagnosis, but mostly for treatment for periodontal disease, which again, is epidemic. It's painless. You have less recession. You have less sensitivity. It's microvisual. And I think one of the advantages, especially for someone in private practice, is it is a hygiene tool. I can refer so many patients to hygiene and I could be doing surgical things um, and because they don't need an assistant. It's less expensive for patients also. And I think the advantage, especially in the Bay Area, is this is for early adopters. And that's what we are. Early adopters like disruption. So what is this? This is a picture at night and the road has lights. See, you know where you're going. But when we're doing non-surgical periodontal treatment, this is what it looks like under the gum line. You have no idea where you're going other than feeling around. So peri perioscopy turns the lights on because visual access is fundamental to predictable, effective root debridement. And there are two ways of doing that. Put a little camera in there or cut it open. So open or closed, well, for us, um, in the endoscopic world, case closed. So you can find uh, information on this on YouTube. I have a channel, it's called Perio. I have over 160 videos. Some of them are on periodontal endoscopy. Most of them are on periodontal microsurgery because my microscope 
had a camera attached to it and I could record surgeries and then edit, edit the videos and do video presentations that are, you know, six to eight minutes. Um, the perioscopy system textbook video, again, outlines the system that I showed you today. Perioscopy training video is a couple hours. Uh, that's required if you have the training, but it does show you what you go through to learn about this training. Um, so again, let's go over the treatment goals, interrupt the disease process, maintain or regenerate periodontal or peri-implant support. And one thing I think is important is that when you're reevaluating things and that requires reevaluation, maintaining is not bad. I mean, it may not be, you know, you're maintaining the six millimeter pocket forever as long as it's not getting worse. I mean, it's not regenerating, but it's not getting worse. So you want to expect your treatment to resolve the inflammatory disease. And that's not easy in the mouth. It's just not easy. Um, critical steps determine your scope of practice. And um, for periodontists, that's not very difficult. But for general practice, especially in, in this country where you have dentists and hygienists, you know, you really have to be on the same page as far as determining your scope of practice. You have to make an accurate diagnosis. So you have to have the tools to make that diagnosis. You have to know appropriate treatments. And a lot of people just don't learn about the various treatments that are out there um, in, the, in, in the realm of periodontal therapy. You have to reevaluate your treatment. So many times patients will come to us for the reevaluation because they've already had this root planing done and it hasn't gotten better. Um, are your treatment goals achieved or maintained? So when do you refer to a specialist? if your diagnosis is outside your scope of practice or if treatment goals were not achieved or maintained. So what is our key takeaway? Our vision is fundamental to what we do. And I know that we wanted to focus on diabetics um, and this is certainly that. Uh, this is certainly something that can help with diabetic patients, but there's so many non-diabetic patients that have periodontal disease as well. And certainly we know that systemically that can be a factor in their overall health. So our vision is fundamental to what we do. Magnification and illumination support our vision with loops. And um, I've been using loops forever, um, lights, and now we have LED lights. So we have very good lighting right on our heads. Um, in our case, microscopes, and then the periodontal endoscope. So this is my email address, uh, my personal email address. If you certainly have any questions, there may be some questions now. So I do want to thank you for your attention. Um, let's see if I don't know, I'm not sure. There's a question. I'll put the question and answer. Oh, what is the cost of this system? Um, in this country, it's anywhere from 16 to $20,000 or 16 to $19,000. Um, if you uh, don't need any training, or if you think you don't need any training, then you don't, you know, um, but the system is about $20,000. $20, which company, the Periscope, uh, the company that uh, sells it now is Zest Dental Solutions. They're a company at, uh, out of Carlsbad, California, which is right near San Diego. So it looks like uh, that's a couple, only a couple questions. Are there so any the, questions, please? You know, I was, we were talking about earlier when we did a test for this Zoom, um, how do you get the perioscope into India? 
probably the only way you can do that is to get some sort of uh, exemption as a uh, teaching facility, as doing research. Um, so, you know, if something like that comes along and you, and you, and you want to try to do that, then don't hesitate to reach out to me because I can hopefully uh, do whatever I can to facilitate that. Do we have any other questions? So there are a couple of questions in the Q and A box. If you can just have a look. Difference between 2001 and 2007 version of the system. 2001 and 2007, there was a system made by DentalView. And so in 2007, <clears throat> What we did was made the consumables for the old system. And then we would help people with the old system adopt the technology if they hadn't. Or we would find uh, offices that were interested and they would buy the system from somebody who wasn't using it. And we would teach them how to use it. So that was kind of a crazy thing. Um, and, uh, but I knew that I could build a better one. And uh, what's really been nice is these things are extremely durable. Um, <clears throat> obviously the sheath, the endoscope fiber itself will wear out. You know, you can't get more than a hundred uses out of it. Um, but at least, at least not, I would say not reliably. Um, so, you know, there's that cost as well over time. So there is one more question by Dr. Manu. Can vertical bone defects be corrected? And can the GTR procedure be ruled out completely? Can vertical defects be corrected? Um, well, if you're do you recall looking at the vertical defects that were corrected on the x-rays that I showed? If you do, those were vertical direct def defects that were corrected with endoscopic debridement only. Can the GTR procedure be ruled out completely? No, because if you don't have an endoscope and you don't attempt that treatment, GTR works. I used to do that all the time. You know, or use endogain or use some sort of biologic or, you know, but then again, even though, even if you're using the minimally invasive surgical therapy or the, or the mist treatment, um, you have to cut it open in order to see. But actually, you know, a lot of these vertical defects, especially three wall defects, if you cut it open, clean it out, just put it back. You don't have to put anything in there and it gets better. Well, <clears throat> this is pretty much the same thing. You know, your, and then the argument is, well, is this true new attachment? If you have less probing depths and if you have bone fill, but histologically, you have a long junctional epithelium. Are you really going to complain about that? No, because from a clinical standpoint, it's better. So let's see uh, the difference between, yeah. Let's see, do we have another question? Does bleeding at the site obscure visibility? Yes, it does. That's why you have to have water coming out, kind of streaming out at, it's, it's about one ounce per minute. Um, and so it's constantly flushing the surface away, the bleeding on the surface. So you can see, um, obviously if you have a lot of inflammation, um, this is what I say. It takes a while for pockets to clear up. 
because you're kind of battling a lot of, um, I wouldn't say granulation tissue, but you could call it that um, until you take some of that away and then it's bleeding less. And that's another reason why if you have a lot of inflammation, it's a good idea to do some simple debridement or something as simple as just using a water pick ahead of time to reduce the amount of inflammation that you have during the procedure. So, we have any other questions? I think uh, that uh, is the end of uh, all the question uh, uh, session, question and answer sessions. Uh, I think uh, we can end at that. And uh, uh, it was truly a great uh, lecture. So a lot of praises for you, sir. Thank you again for your time. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Like said uh, the advantages of uh, no assisting, the focus, the contrast, we, the video, the software are all the vital things that we require for our root debridement. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, you're rightly said, sir, evidence base is what we look at and the 92% uh, uh, reduction is what uh, is, is vital for us uh, in our uh, uh, periodontal implications. So uh, going upon uh, the saying of Abraham Lincoln, upon the subject of education, I can only say that I view it as the most important subject which we as people can be engaged in. So I think we should and should and should be engaged in knowing and learning the knowledge of what you just put across. And the roads to success is always on the route to Bryant. So thank you once again, sir, for your time. I request- You're welcome. To, uh, uh, take uh, uh, accept this uh, certificate of appreciation from our JSS AHER. We will email this to you right away, sir. Great, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, oh. you all have a great day. Appreciate uh, it. Thank you, Dr. Nagesh, sir, for the time and all the delegates for being and belonging here for this enriching Educated Periscopy Week. Thank you, ma'am. I hope we justified the value of each other's time. Needless to say, it was indeed a pleasure having everyone with us. Thank you all for attending. We hope we all learned something and enjoyed a little bit too. Thank you, each and everyone. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'm signing off now. Thank you, sir. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, sir. All right, you're welcome.